Om Namah Shivaya Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Namaste. So, in the previous series, which you should watch <laughs> if you haven't, uh, we talked about how we can create a metaphor, an image, or a concept of a universal AI. We call it the God GPT. And like any GPT class AI, you give this a prompt and it replies. But instead of replying with words like an ordinary human GPT, it replies with states of being and consciousness. So because God is inconceivable by definition, we have to use a metaphor. And even Vishnu and Shiva and the goddess and all of these uh, different names and symbols uh, are human-like. Actually, they're just metaphors for something which is beyond our understanding. So we don't even attempt to understand it, but we use these metaphors as means of communication. So the same is true of the God GPT metaphor. It's just a symbol. It's just an image, a way of explaining that which is inexplicable, of conceiving that which is inconceivable. So now that we have uh, put that out there, what are the prompts that we should use to invoke the maximum benefit from the universal GPT, the God GPT? Huh? And so, now we're going to enter into the Shiva Sahasranam, the thousand names of Lord Shiva, with this in mind. So, a little bit of background on the Shiva Sahasranam. Uh, when I first started looking into it about a year ago, I was rather dismayed because there are at least eight versions of it extant, in the literature. The Linga Purana is perhaps the earliest one, or maybe the Shiva Purana version, but there's also a version, actually two different versions, in Mahabharata, in the uh, Shanti Parva, after the Battle of Kurukshetra, and uh, later on in the Krishna Parva. Then there's other ones around, and they're all different. <laughs> That's the thing. I was trying to come up with one authoritative version that everyone could refer to as the key, but really there isn't one. And even among the different editions of Shiva Purana, the versions differ in the key areas of certain terms and certain names. So in the end, I just had to pick one, like, okay, that one. <laughs> and say, okay, that's the one we're going to go with. Because, I mean, really, they're all equal in quality. So we're going to use the one from the Ganguli translation. Now, the problem with the Ganguli translation of Mahabharata is that he regards the Shanti Parva. The, uh, and the Bhishma Parva, after the Battle of Kurukshetra, when Bhishma is lying on the bed of arrows, and all the great sages and incarnations of God, and, of course, the Pandava brothers and all their uh, friends and wives and so on, gathered around Grandfather Bhishma. And as a, a last rite, they recited so many wonderful prayers. I mean, it's just amazing. But Ganguly, in his so-called critical edition, says that this represents 
a disruption to the narrative flow of Mahabharata. Well, I think Ganguly is coming from a Western novelistic point of view because Mahabharata is basically a Purana. And it's the first Purana, actually, to present events in chronological order. The other Puranas, including the Shiva Purana, don't bother to attach dates or sequences to anything. They just narrate stories which have been passed down from antiquity. But the Mahabharata recounts the story of the Pandava brothers and their fight to reclaim their rightful kingdom with the aid of Krishna. So <laughs> after all that happened and Bhishma is on the bed of arrows, this is really the culmination. This is the climax. This is the, uh, really, the raison d'etre, the reason for the existence of Mahabharata. <laughs> because these prayers, I mean, actually, there's so many nice prayers in Mahabharata, but this one is the most exquisite and the most powerful. So we're going to use the introduction uh, this is the introduction to the introduction. <laughs> the actual introduction is spoken by sage Upamanyu. Now, who is Upamanyu? Well, first of all, we have to analyze the name because in all Puranic literatures, names are very important clues to the identity and the function of these characters. Upa means up to, with, and manu means like spirit, like the metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, -E, the metal of a horse or other animal. So this means high-spirited. Huh? He's very high-spirited, and he is really such a pure devotee of Shiva that he resides eternally on Mount Kailash. And Krishna met him, Vasudeva, met him when he went to approach Shiva to receive weapons, among them the Pashupati weapon, which belongs to Shiva alone. So when Krishna was on his way to visit Kailash, he met Upamanyu on the way. And Upamanyu instructed him in so many things on how to approach Shiva to gain success. And one of the things that he taught was these thousand names. So Upamanyu opens by giving the origin of these thousand holy names and how they became known to humanity. Vasudeva Uvacha Tatasa prayato bhutva mamatata yudhishthira pranjali praha viprashir nama sanghara maditaha. Vasudeva said, O oh my dear cousin Yudhishthir, the sage Upamanyu, after concentrating his mind, told me the thousand holy names of Shiva with folded hands. So, in Mahabharata, Krishna, being very truthful, admits that he didn't know these thousand names. They were given to him by Upamanyu. Because Upamanyu is such a great devotee that even Krishna has to glorify him and show his importance by accepting teachings from him. So this is the power of a pure devotee. The uh, names are to be chanted, as it says here, with folded hands. That means in a spirit of surrender, with concentrated mind, and in a mood of devotion. Because these are really the most profound prayers in the whole Vedas. Upamanyur uvacha 
Brahma Proktaya Rishi Proktaya Veda Vedanga Sambhavai Sarva Lokeshu Vikyatai Stanum Stoshyami Nama Bihi Sage Upamanyu said, I pray to him using those names that had been recited by Brahma and other sages that have arisen from Vedas and Vedangas and are famous throughout the world. Now he gives the origin. He says these thousand names originate with Lord Brahma and they are drawn from the Vedas and Vedangas. The four Vedas, Rik, Sama, Yajus, and Atarva, and the Vedangas. And the Vedangas are all the ancillary and commentary literatures, including the Puranas, the Itihasas, the Tantras, and so many other scriptures that are uh, serving the purpose of the Vedas, which is to attain enlightenment, complete identification with Brahman. So these names are very ancient, going back to the beginning of the universe. And of course, we narrated all those stories, how Brahma and Vishnu met Shiva in the beginning of the universe back in our series on Shiva Purana, which you should definitely also watch for background. Mahad Bhir Vihitai Satyai Siddhyai Sarvarta Sadakai Rishina Tandina Bhaktya Kritai Deva Kritatmana These names have been praised by the great. They are true and give occult powers. They help you to accomplish any work and have been told by Sage Tandi whose heart is immersed in the Vedas. Now, what is the character of these holy names? They're powerful. They give mystic powers. They give material enjoyment. They give spiritual knowledge. Most importantly, they open the door to the favor of Lord Shiva. Anyone that Lord Shiva favors becomes successful without a doubt. So these names are very important for devotees who want to attain success in self-realization and in life. Yatoktair loka vikyatair muni bhishtatvadarshibihi Pravarang pratamang svargyang sarvabhutahitang shubham Shutai Sarvatra Jagati Brahma Lokavataritai. I pray to him who does good to all beings, who is worshipped by me, by sages and philosophers, who is the first among all and who can grant us heaven, using these famous well-known names. Those names have been heard everywhere in the universe, having spread from the region of Brahma. Now, they were given to humanity by the sage Tandi. And Tandi uh, was residing in the heavenly planets, and he heard these names from Brahma. And from Brahma, he brought them to the earth planet and gave them to the sages. Yatadrahasyam paramang brahma proktang sanatanam Bakshe Yadukula Sreshta Shrinushvavahito Mama. All of them are fraught with the element of truth. With those names I shall adore him who is Supreme Brahman, who has been declared unto the universe by the Vedas, and who is eternal. O chief of Yadu's race, I shall now tell you those names. Please hear them with rapt attention. And so, these names are to be used to pray to Shiva. If you don't have any desires, 
if all you want is liberation, then you should pray to Shiva without thinking of anything except his glory. And so he begins to glorify Shiva, Upamanyu speaking here. And he begins to say, to whom these names are addressed? Shiva is equal to all. He does good to everyone. Even when he appears to be angry or violent or destructive, he is actually benefiting those beings by purifying them of their illusions. Now, Shiva is worshipped by all great sages. Yeah, we know there are some sectarian Hindus who don't believe in Shiva or who denigrate Shiva. And by doing this, they are placing themselves in great jeopardy. Uh, it's very dangerous to insult or blaspheme or offend Shiva because Shiva is all omniscient and all powerful, <laughs> omnipotent. So uh, he definitely responds to both praise and also to offenses. And especially if one offends his devotees, uh, Vishnu in the Shiva Purana prays to Shiva that if any of my followers denigrate you or your devotees, you please make them reside in hell. So this is the origin of the idea of uh, the offenders of God going to hell for a long, long time. And so we'll continue with this introduction next time. It's quite long, but it really explains the nature and properties and powers of the Shiva Sahasranamam. And it should be understood and comprehended before hearing the thousand names themselves. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.